Hey church, good morning and happy Sunday. Today we're going to be in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. So if you would like to find that in your Bible and join me there, I think it'll be worth your while. This passage is about the core of what it means to be Christian and of Christian worship. Last week we looked at the beginning of Romans 12, where Paul leaves the theology that he had been working on behind for now to talk about the application of that truth in the life of Christians. Maybe I could put this in a more specific way, maybe a more appropriate way. Is it for the first 11 chapters of Romans, Paul is describing why all people, Jew and Gentile alike, have found mercy in Jesus Christ if they come to him because of what God has done through his faithfulness through grace that we call justification to make us right with God. And now Paul is describing what happens in the life of a Christian when that is worked out, what we would call sanctification, which means the maturing of the Christian person to produce the fruits of the Spirit that God has given us to do. So uh, sometimes we get these in the wrong order. We think that our sanctification, becoming more like God, is what gives us our justification, God's approval and forgiveness. But it's just the opposite. It's his justification that is the foundation for us that then helps us to live out the life of a Christian. So Paul is describing now what true Christian worship is like. He even used a metaphor last week to say, you remember all the list of things they did in the temple? Well, now for us in the church, coming together in this group project called God's Church, where we all play a part, this is what he's destined us for. And we share our gifts together, the things that God, through his grace, has specifically made me and you able to do. We share those to serve and build up the church. And so together, our mind is being transformed to godliness instead of thinking in the terms of this age. And this age that we live in thinks in terms of power and control and profit and prosperity and luxury and ease. And Christians also enjoy the good world that God made. I mean, we enjoy a vacation as much as anyone else and a great chocolate chip cookie or time to spend with family on the porch. I mean, we, we enjoy the good things of this world but we don't try to hoard them, and we don't try to steer and control the lives of others, at least not if the Spirit of Christ is in us. So Paul will now describe what the life of a Christian can look like when we're expressing love and empathy and forbearance towards others appropriately. And in this passage, there's an interesting transition from uh, thinking just about inside the church to thinking about how we relate to all the people around us in our communities. And for them, it was in the city of Rome. And for us, it would be here in the cities of Bentonville and Rogers and Bella Vista and the other surrounding towns that we live in. But exactly which point Paul shifts from thinking inside the church to our outward influence is not exactly clear. It might be in verse 14 when he says, bless those who persecute you. And those words sound like they came straight from Jesus' lips to Paul's pen. That might be when he turns his mind outwards because it's hard to think of people in the church persecuting each other, although it's likely there was some of that going on in Rome between these strong, powerful Christians and the weak Christians that Paul addresses in Romans 14 and 15. Maybe it is verse 17 when Paul seems to stop using the language of one another, which is his typical language for people in the church, And he starts to use the language of anyone and everyone. So he says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. That might be when he turns his gaze outward. But what we have is this, that the justification God has given us now helps us to live a life of sanctification where we're being transformed. Our mind and our actual embodied life is being transformed so that we act different, look different. We don't just talk different. We actually are disciples of Christ who live different and that that will affect both how we treat people in the church and people outside the church. And then next week, at the beginning of Romans 13, we'll see that affects our attitudes towards even the national institutions like governments. And we'll slow down when we get there and spend three weeks. I'm going to preach one week and then Ben and then Daniel. You'll get three different sermons 
uh, on this section about the church and authority and the Christian and government as we ponder some of the nuances of that. It's a very complex idea in Scripture. And so we'll try to draw some of that out and think about how that applies for Christians today. But today, we're looking at verses 9 through 21, and we're considering these ideas that love, according to Paul, is this outward expression of what God has done in us, and it needs to be sincere. That there is cheap talk about love. There is, there is talk about love that never gets to actually loving. It just is talk. And imagine it like this with me for a moment. Imagine uh, being with somebody who talks and talks and talks about their favorite hobby, but then they never actually do the hobby. Like somebody who talks about fishing all the time and has boxes full of lures, hundreds of dollars of rods and reels, maybe even a fancy boat or two, and yet they're never on the water. <laughs> Think about somebody who talks about, at great length, making the perfect chocolate chip cookie. Oh, they theorize about it. They have recipes of ingredients with the salt and the sugar and the butter and the you know, double handful of chocolate chips to get the dough just to the right consistency, crispy or chewy, however it is that you like it. You can almost taste them, can't you? But what we want isn't to talk about cookies. What we want is to eat cookies. What we want is to break it open and to smell it hot from the oven and to taste it where our teeth break through that crispy outer bit of the cookie and into the chewy middle and the chocolate chips are melty and glorious. Am I making you hungry yet? Because I'm, I'm getting ready to go have a cookie. That is what we want is to experience it in its richness. And the same is true of love. Talking about Christian love without taking action is really just nonsense. It doesn't help anybody. Talking about Christians being different from the world without actually becoming disciples of Jesus and practicing the differences is really nonsense. It's a waste of everybody's time. Here's a story to help illustrate the point. In the 1930s, uh, in Germany, the Nazi party was on the rise uh, in power. And the German churches began to notice troubling things happening within the Nazi government. For instance, they were trying to rewrite scripture. They wanted to take the Old Testament out of the Bible and anything that talked positively about Jews or anything about Jesus being a Jew, they're trying to erase this from the doctrine and the teaching of the churches. Well, there was more than one response from Christians and churches. Just like today, there's many people who have many opinions on, on every aspect of the Christian in the world, at that point in Germany, there was some churches that just went along with the Nazi party's plans. They just capitulated. They just participated. And then there were churches that resisted. And there was, in fact, a group of churches that came together that were called the Confessing Church. And they wanted to remain independent and have their religious freedom not be tarnished. And so they worked really hard toward that. They wrote about it and talked about it. Uh, in fact, there was probably two concerns. One was to maintain independence, and the other one was to maintain doctrinal purity. They didn't want to be told by the state what to teach. And those sound important to us, don't they? I mean, they are important. We don't want the church to be controlled by the government. We don't want the church to be told what it can teach and can't teach. We want to rely on the Scripture, on the Word of God, and on the Spirit of God, and on Christ-likeness for who we are and what we do. But there was a troubling pattern in the Confessing Church that Dietrich Bonhoeffer pointed out and criticized a little bit later on. But that in 1935, this woman named Marga Musel identified and wrote a memorandum to the church about. And this is what she saw. The church is spending so much time talking about their independence and talking about their religious freedom that they are not engaging their mission. There are Jews that are hurting, that are starving, that are being persecuted in so many ways, and there's anti-Semitic language being used by the government and sometimes even in the church, and we need to do something about it. We need to take care of their practical needs. And uh, she was asked to write this memorandum, and I want to read you an excerpt from it. This is Margaret Musil in 1935. She said, one cannot adhere to the confessing church and simply disregard the gospel's demands 
which are inconvenient. Wow. She saw that the church was doing a lot of talking about their rights as a church, but not engaging their mission as a church. She also said this, the church simply must take the path of obedience and faith, even if it knows that it will thus lose outward safeguards. Then the Lord Christ, on whose behalf the church acts, bears the responsibility. Marga Musel's memorandum argued that what the church needed to do in their time and their place was throw their trust on the Lord Jesus so much that they'd be willing to lose their freedoms, lose that kind of distinction uh, within the world in order to have the distinction that matters most, which is the distinction of unhypocritical love, of action love. So here's the thing about love that Paul discusses in these verses. He says it must be sincere. This is in verse 9, Romans 12, 9. He says love must be sincere or genuine might be in your translation. The Greek word he uses is love must be non-hypocritical. And we all know what hypocritical love looks like. It's when people talk the talk but don't walk the walk. It's when people talk about loving or have attitudes they say are loving but they're not willing to follow through with acts of justice, with actions of compassion, with acts of mercy. Instead, it's just talk and no action. So love can fail whenever there is some inner affection. You know, the heart says, oh, I love everybody, but the body doesn't participate through acting. That can cause love to fail. And Paul points it out right here in verses 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. And he does it by using a bunch of very uh, short, pointed Greek phrases. They're almost like bullet points. And so the first phrase, love must be sincere, in, in Greek could actually just be translated like this. Non-hypocritical love is, or in English, sincere love is, and then a bunch of bullet points. And this is what Paul says. It is the kind of love that hates the evil, clings to the good that's devoted to one another in brotherly love, that honors one another above yourselves, that doesn't lack in zeal but keeps spiritual fervor, that serves the Lord. It's love that is joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. It is love that shares with God's people who are in need and practices hospitality. You see how by just understanding that kind of list Paul has right there, that all of these commands that look like many different commands in English, like all of these things to keep track of, are defining sincere love, non-hypocritical love for Paul. It's almost like the list he has in 1 Corinthians 13. So in 1 Corinthians 13, the famous love passage that's read at weddings all of the time, Paul gives some, some great teaching on love, like known all around the world. Uh, Daniel, our associate minister, just reminded me minutes ago that that chapter is, is quoted uh, in the sitcom, How I Met Your Mother, that Marshall just says, what about this Bible passage? He recites it when they're talking about planning their wedding. And so people who maybe, uh, or even people in sitcoms, people who maybe don't pay much attention to the scripture or don't consider themselves to be disciples of Jesus, know 1 Corinthians 13. And this passage is very similar to it. Paul is saying, do you want to know what love looks like? It looks like this. Now, the lists are a little different in Corinthians and in Romans. Why would that be? Why doesn't Paul the Apostle just use the same list in both places or in all of his letters? Well, because this list was written to the Romans. And it's for us, just like the Corinthian letter is for us, but that one was written to the Corinthians. And they had different problems, different ways that their love was breaking down. For the Corinthians, it seems like it mostly had to do with posturing and pride about their spiritual gifts. Some of them are speaking in tongues in church, and others are prophesying, and they're all speaking over each other and trying to be most important. And Paul teaches them that love is a more important gift than all the other gifts they've been given. And so he's trying to correct that prideful behavior. For the church in Rome... They have those that feel strong and those that feel weak, those that are in power and those that are powerless. And these lines are largely drawn along racial lines, but also along some religious convictions. 
And so these people are experiencing their breakdown in love in a different way than the Corinthians were. And you and I, in our context here, probably experience the same problems in kind, but with different specifics than the Romans or the Corinthians. So Paul's list to us might have been uh, unique in some different ways, but it would be about the same core idea. God loved you. He gave gifts to all of us to bring those gifts together for this joint project that's called the church to serve the world. And so true non-hypocritical love is going to have these kind of characteristics. This is tasting the cookie. This is not talking about it. This is tasting it, experiencing it with others. And Paul can easily turn those thoughts not just towards the church, but then towards outsiders also, or towards anybody whose relationship is really problematic, people who are set against us for one reason or another. And those people could be in the church or they could be outside the church. But this is where we start to see people as being the other, the other side of the aisle, the other group, the other opinion, the opponents, the enemies even. And so for Paul, he can say, uh, quoting Jesus here in verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. And there's a striking chord of empathy in these verses from Paul. You know, to, to bless someone in a powerful way demands empathy. To bless someone in a way that's not generic, that sticks with them, that they remember that blessing for years to come, requires empathy. Because you can give a generic blessing to anybody. You can just say, you know, hey, um, God bless you. And they might say, thank you, but it's not going to be remembered for decades. But whatever you say to somebody, I see in you that maybe you don't even see in yourself that God has given you a gift that whenever you pray with other people, your prayers are powerful to touch their hearts for Jesus Christ. You have a way of praying with people that draws them into worship. So God bless you. And God bless you to use your, your prayer gift. That will stick with somebody for 5, 10, 20 years. They may never forget that you blessed them in a specific way. And cursing works the same way. When you say something about somebody that's hurtful and you, you curse them, but it actually is not true of them, it just rolls off their back like water off duck because it doesn't stick. It doesn't have that power of penetrating and piercing to their inner being. But when you say something about someone that they know to be true about themselves and that they hate, and you say it in a hateful way, it can stick with them for decades. They may never forget because it was incisive and it was penetrating. So Paul here says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, because he knows the power of how those words can stick, especially when they're said with truth, when you know somebody well enough to speak the truth about them. So Paul says, instead of cursing, bless, and Look at the empathy in these verses. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. All of this has to do with our attitudes towards each other and our ability to listen. Do I hear you? Do I hear what you're concerned about? Do I hear your life experience? What life is like in your body? What life is like in your town and in your world? Can I bless you accurately because I've listened and paid attention to who you are? Paul is showing us the way of love and discipleship, the way of genuine love towards people even uh, that might be hard to bless. And now he'll turn towards enemies, the hardest group of all. In verse 17, he teaches us about the way of forbearance. You might say it's positive non-resistance. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everybody, and if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, it's mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul's path that he learned from Jesus of positive non-resistance is not the same thing as acquiescing to evil. This is not saying, well, I guess evil just wins. 
It'll just have to have its way. This is not saying that's just how things work in the world, folks. This is not giving in and saying, well, the, you know, the politics, business, love, it's just, it's real life and it's harder than the Bible's teachings and sometimes you have to cheat in politics and sometimes you have to cheat in business and sometimes you have to cheat in love. No, this is not Paul saying evil wins. This is Paul saying, let's not keep the cycle of evil spinning faster and faster by returning evil for evil. When someone cheats against us or wrongs us or does something filthy in government, whenever somebody does something filthy in our relationships, we have a choice. That people have done evil to us, but we can resist by showing kindness, by inviting people to the table, by feeding them, by still serving those warm chocolate chip cookies to people who would see us undone and destroyed if they had their way. And we can do that because we trust God, because we believe that the power of the one who raised Jesus from the dead and vindicated him will also make sure that justice is served, that God will not allow things to go unseen to, but that he will deal with it. So when we learn these things about living out discipleship, we can see that for Paul it's extremely practical. It's not about talk. It's not about coercion. It's not about playing with the power of this age and trying to use the tools of this age. It's about the transformation of our mind together as the church. That even though the world works in ways of coercion and power, we work through cookies through offering drinks to people who don't like us, by blessing people accurately because we've listened to them and paid attention to them, by loving sincerely and not hypocritically, by doing what Marga Musil said, which is acting boldly, even if it costs us our outward safeguards so that we can throw ourselves in trust on Jesus Christ. This is an important message for the church in 2020, for the church in Bentonville. How can we live this out together? What would it look like if the church in 2020 trusted Jesus to see that justice is done and didn't try to act coercively or to use power or manipulation, didn't try to use mass opinion to, to influence the world, but influence the world through acts of sincere love, through positive non-resistance? What could change in our world if Christians decided to act this way? A lot could change. It could be transformative. I want to read this passage just one more time, but from Eugene Peterson's The Message. This uh, little version is artistic, and Eugene Peterson had the soul, not just of a preacher and a minister, but of an artist also. And Paul's words here in Romans, written to the Roman church about how they needed to live out love, uh, uh, are for us too but was written to them, Eugene Peterson put it in some modern language that maybe is, I don't know, just closer to the way that we actually talk and think today. I'd just like to read this so that it maybe it would spark our imaginations. Uh, so from the message, Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. Love from the center of who you are, and don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. I just imagine if Jesus showed up here today at our church and he would say, have they invented chocolate chips yet? Yes, Jesus. Have they invented cookies yet? Yes, Jesus. And he would say, great, we have all we need for evangelism. Let's get baking. <laughs> Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies, no cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. God says, I'll do the judging. I'll take care of it. 
Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. A word for the church today. Let's follow it in prayer and in faithfulness. Let's not love merely in words, but in action and in truth. Let's pair our hearts and our bodies, the transformation of our mind and the living sacrifice of our bodies, to love people around us and to love them first. Love you, church. Can't wait to see you soon.